now he's my boss. And, uh, <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, just a few words about ourselves. Uh, we're in the company also behind Cloudify. Uh, actually, me and Yaron knew each other for the history uh, around the memory technology, but uh, the thing that I'm going to talk about right now is really about orchestration, uh, which is basically an automation. Cloudify for those. How many people heard the word uh, about, about Cloudify? Can you raise their hand? There's one, two. Good. Not, <laughs> but not from tonight. <laughs> okay, so we got that uh, covered. Uh, so first of all, Cloudify is an open source orchestration, uh, and uh, you can see that it's more known in the OpenStack community. Uh, this is actually a survey from the OpenStack community, and it's uh, alongside the, uh, the uh, Kubernetes of the world and the uh, Docker Swarm of the world in which we're going to talk about. Uh, we also know about the fact that we're uh, the guys behind Tosca. Um, in general, uh, we'll talk about orchestration, uh, which is uh, an automation model, and we'll compare the different approaches and when we'll actually go through what Docker Swarm is doing, what uh, uh, Kubernetes is doing, how they compare between themselves, uh, what we're doing in that space, what OpenStack is doing in that space. So it's kind of uh, covering the space from different angles, and hopefully with that you get a bigger, better picture of what is orchestration, but also what are the different approaches to orchestration, how they can actually work together, uh, where they actually compete with one another, like in the case of Docker Swarm and, and uh, Kubernetes. And, uh, and, and hopefully with that, you'll be much more knowledgeable about those options and, and how to use them and when to use each of them. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the general idea uh, behind orchestration. And uh, if I talk about specifically in the terms of container orchestration, uh, what we're basically talking about is taking individual containers and putting them together in a context of a workload application, etc. And what do we need to actually do that? We basically need the ability to take a container and run it in multiple hosts. Uh, we need to be able to provide them a placement control, affinity, anti-affinity, those type of things. Uh, we need to be able to stitch them together in terms of networking. Um, and uh, also, uh, we need to handle things like capability, what happens when something fails, how do we automate that, the recovery process, and how do we automate uh, the ability to do something uh, that I think your own touch provides an endpoint, uh, one end network endpoint, multiple containers, so that we need, especially in a microservice kind of world, we need to deal with each individual piece of the puzzle, but actually get a, a, a one endpoint uh, in order that we'll have a simpler interface with uh, other services or external. Uh, also, rolling up, with those are the, the things that uh, are there. So in general, if I try to put a general theme into that, if you try to do any of those processes manually, especially in the world of containers, which you have usually many, and it's relatively dynamic, meaning that you have uh, uh, those containers running and spawning out very quickly, you'll find yourself in a pretty complex environment. So, you, so, so I think that's kind of the, the, the reason why container became very popular sorry, orchestration became very popular with, with uh, containers because containers really push the limit on, on the fact that it becomes very complex, so almost impossible to run application without orchestration. That's why we're seeing orchestration becoming an integrated part with containers, more so than other technologies or other application models that used to be before that needed orchestration, but it wasn't such a necessity as it is with containers. Because, and with that, I wanted to hand off to uh, Hello? Oh, that's good. All right. Uh, I'll get this down. Um, so uh, really the focus today is uh, very uh, high level of Kubernetes, Docker Swarm. I want to do Mesos too, but there's no way there's enough time for that. Uh, so just a, a high level uh, overview of the, uh, the approaches of each of those tools. Uh, also the uh, related infrastructure automation because uh, as we know, the uh, container orchestration is pretty much limited to the orchestration of containers. Obviously, a container needs to be inside of something. Maybe not obviously, but it's running on a machine of some kind, and the machine itself could be a target of orchestration as well. That's part of the place where uh, our Cloudify can serve, in fact. Um, and uh, so we'll go over some of those uh, 
uh, third party uh, infrastructure automation and then uh, the Cloudify Tosca approach to automation. And then I'll try to uh, squeeze in a demo at the end, which has us a, a quick example of uh, infrastructure automation around Docker Swarm. Okay. How many people here use Google? <laughs> Every, I mean, use Kubernetes, sorry. <laughs> 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 Nobody, right? Nobody uses it? Okay. Well, that's surprising to me. Uh, anyway, so uh, Kubernetes is uh, by far the most popular container management system out there. Open source by Google, uh, based on their own internal, their long experience with uh, container management. Um, it's not what they run internally. It's a it's a way of sharing technology with the outside world. It, has a, it doesn't operate at Google scale, but very few of us need to. And it has a very uh, standard uh, master worker pattern that is common across all of these tools, uh, including ours. Um, it's got some uh, key concepts like the pod. Um, with uh, Kubernetes, you don't actually manage containers, you manage pods. Okay? And what a pod is is a unit deployment based on the container. So um, pods are deployed on a single host. And uh, the pods are very intimate with each other. They, they exist in the same C group. They share a network namespace. So for all practical purposes, if you were to um, imagine a container as a virtual machine, uh, which is wrong, but just to, for a moment, cast your mind there. The idea is these would all be processes running on the same VM for all practical purposes. They will see each other, they communicate with each other through localhost. Uh, this turns out to be a very, very uh, handy feature uh, for a lot of uh, patterns out there, like a sidecar pattern. For us in particular, it came up. Uh, became obvious uh, for monitoring, which is a service that, that we provide, that the idea that I could deploy my containers in pairs, one of which maybe was monitoring the other to uh, establish the workload on it. Now we have to wait for that to come back up. All right, so they also have that concept of a replication controller. The replication controller's job is basically to maintain a certain number of pods running. Um, there's also a provided sort of around the replication controller uh, service is also auto heal and scale capability. You can scale manually just by setting the number of uh, replicas in a replication controller. Um, and uh, the system will auto heal based on Google's uh, internal heartbeat. Uh, Google's also in the process of uh, adding a uh, um, auto scale that's based on arbitrary metrics now, which is great. Up to now, it's been uh, CPU memory utilization type measures, and they're going to open that up to any kind of metric. Um, the uh, concept of service, uh, this is one thing that comes from uh, uh, Kubernetes' uh, implicit focus on web-style applications. So the idea is you can uh, define a collection of, uh, of pods that uh, are exposed as a service to the outside world. So they become a load balanced, they receive a load balanced IP on the cluster network. So you can drive traffic in there and automatically uh, load balance uh, across the internal uh, containers, or pods actually. Um, overlay networks, uh, so uh, there's an IP per pod, every pod has an IP and DNS as well. You can set up in Kubernetes so that every pod has a DNS name inside the cluster, of course. Um, no, no supported master HA. I notice uh, they, uh, there's uh, instructions on the uh, Kubernetes website for creating uh, um, um, high availability on the manager, but that's not currently supported by them. Um, they are container agnostic, so in practice that means uh, Rocket and uh, Docker, of course. Um, so they're trying to stay uh, stay unopinionated in that way. They're very opinionated in the approach, which is a very microservices oriented approach. Um, and they provide uh, placement affinity and anti-affinity as well, um, not to the granularity of Swarm. Um, and then they, uh, also, they have a deployment model uh, based on YAML. So they, 
they tend to take a, by default, a more declarative uh, approach to configuration or orchestration, meaning you define the endpoint, how you want the cluster to look, and then you hand that to Kubernetes and it does whatever magical things it does. Uh, you don't tell it every step exactly how you want it to be. And this is basically a graphical representation of that. Um, and that's pretty simple stuff. Um, and then to, just to jump to Swarm for a really quick overview. So uh, Docker Swarm as of 112. So 112 is a new release of Swarm. If you haven't looked at Swarm before this, uh, it's really different now. It's actually it's actually in Docker. It's no longer, in a way, it's just a mode, as I should say. It's really a mode inside of Docker Engine itself. So uh, previously, uh, Swarm was a separate product and uh, and really a, maybe a combination of several products. Uh, but now, everything is baked into the Docker Engine. So um, like Kubernetes, the, the main goal is to handle multi-node orchestration of containers across, well, across multiple nodes, of course, uh, as opposed to the old mode where every, really every uh, container engine was its own island and uh, you had to deal with them separately. So again, uh, there's a lot of similarities here and in fact, the in a lot of ways, uh, as I point out, well, not here, but uh, elsewhere, the uh, really uh, Docker is playing catch up with Kubernetes in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, so a lot of the features you see on this list were actually uh, previously mentioned in Kubernetes. Now, that would be, for example, the service support. Same concept as what I mentioned for uh, Kubernetes. Um, overlay networks and DNS, essentially the same concept. Um, one thing they have built in is a highly available manager. Um, so. They will actually have a, uh, a console implementation on the on, this, on the, uh, the manager side, so that uh, you can have a. Um, I think they recommend three to seven manager instances, and uh, <coughs> if any of them fail, obviously a new they'll have a uh, leader election process, and the system will continue. So this is uh, you know obviously huge for production. Um, by default, network security. Um, it's, set up so uh, everything's encrypted by default between the nodes and, and including client certificates so the, the the entire cluster is authorized against itself uh, with an internal CA it does all the, the generation of certificates for you and everything so really provides sort of a capsule around the uh, around the cluster it's something you can do in Kubernetes but isn't there by default um, node placement, uh, anti-affinity and affinity, it's got a very fine grain support with this through labeling. You can label the nodes where you actually start uh, the Docker engine. You can also label uh, individual containers and then say, I want containers connected to each other. And, uh, and then uh, they, <coughs> they, more of an imper they have more of an imperative model. So by default, they don't have a, uh, a YAML orchestration model that gets managed by the manager um, but they have another product called Compose that provides that ability uh, and it's based on YAML and it looks you know, somewhat similar to the Google uh, Kubernetes version. So uh, some of the big contrasts if you've attempted since nobody said they actually use Kubernetes uh, nobody struggled through setting it up perhaps uh, um, sort of because of its unopinionated uh, nature, its uh, unopinionated, uh, um, not uh, orchestration opinion, but its uh, unopinionated uh, technology about its components, um, it requires quite a bit of setup. Okay, it's not nearly as you have to set up uh, three or four different uh, products, uh, and, the, and it can be fairly complex. And Swarm is just baked in, so you start up the master, you start up the workers and you just basically point them at the master and you're ready to go. It's all done. The DNS is all running, the security is running. Go ahead. Just a very quick question. Um, in the previous slide you said manager worker versus master worker. Is oh. that a distinction? Okay, yeah, there's no real distinction there. Um, it's just that in Swarm they call it the manager. <laughs> but it's the same, it's the same role. Um, 
Uh, lack of HA in Kubernetes, that could be a minus. Well, well let me go back one. The, the pod concept, I said that turns out to be very useful. It's not necessarily a necessity for you uh, in particular, but uh, it really does come in handy. So the lack of it um, is a negative, I think. Uh, you could possibly cobble something together in a swarm that created a pod, but there's issues with uh, the one thing about a pod is that it also uh, has a life cycle where they're bound, the containers are bound to each other. So even if you did manage to deploy separate containers in their own C groups and their own namespaces and the same node, the manager would still not know that I have to always kill that one when the other one goes away, that type of thing. So well, maybe there's a way to do it. I, I'm not aware of it. Um, whoops. <laughs> Um, okay, Swarm's tied to Docker, maybe a negative. I mean, if you really want an unopinionated that container um, technology, then that may be a negative for you. Uh, lack of auto scaling, of course. <coughs> the uh, that's a lot of these things are things that no doubt will be addressed in the near future by the by the team there, but uh, uh, and probably just this amounts to a list of things they didn't quite get to to catch up to Google's uh, the Kubernetes. Um, the Swarm security is definitely a plus uh, built in because of the complexity and just having it there. <coughs> a declarative versus an imperative, if that matters to you, if you care that it's a third, it's a, it's a different product that does the, um, uh, the configuration, might be important to you. I think in general, uh, you know, uh, Google itself and uh, Kubernetes, uh, as far as uh, container orchestration, they have a larger, a much longer track record. Um, a lot of these features that have just appeared in Swarm have been in Kubernetes for years. Um, so, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, Swarm is playing catch up. Um, but I think it's really worth the second look now because of the simplicity. Um, and it may be sufficient for the use case, and it does have the highly available manager, which is huge if you're going to push it into production. Um, some related services. Uh, so we're moving out uh, a little bit uh, sort of up the stack because there's one thing about uh, I mentioned earlier about container management is that it's, um, it's not just the uh, obviously you need to manage containers on something. So they're running on hosts and what happens if the host dies? What happens if I need more hosts? What happens if the entire cluster simply runs out of uh, compute? Um, the, the, the container managers have no answer for that. They don't care about that really. It's not what they're managing. So uh, some of these other services have addressed issues like that, plus adding additional features on the perhaps on the open source version. Uh, uh, Google Container Engine uh, hosted Kubernetes uh, in Google Google Compute Engine. So Google Compute Engine will provide the dynamic infrastructure, the auto healing. Um, you're still going to have, <coughs> I believe, you still have a, uh, a manager that's, that's uh, not uh, uh, won't survive a crash, but uh, all in all, you wind up with a dynamic uh, way to scale uh, in a service on the, on the Google Cloud. Um, AWS Containers this is more like a direct competitor. Um, so they just offer containers as another kind of uh, vert driver um, uh, where they can you know, spawn containers that are basically just like another uh, virtual machine. But they, they will also do uh, auto scaling of infrastructure uh, for you. And then Azure has a, actually has a hosted swarm with the heal and scale. Uh, I think they also have a, a Mesos uh, DCOS uh, as well. But, uh, so likewise, providing infrastructure, healing and scaling. Um, and IBM also has one <coughs> similarly. And there's many others, there's many other smaller players these are just big players by, sorry, I can't get much of it. <laughs> I'm blowing my punch line. <laughs> okay, and then the next. Uh, so OpenStack is one I didn't mention, so anybody know what that is? Yes. <laughs> okay, how about that? <laughs> All right, so that is, that's Magnum. So you guys don't know your Zoolander very well. <laughs> that is Magnum. That's also Magnum. 
<laughs> 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, blew your head off. So. <laughs> that just blew my mind. <laughs> so, um, dirty Harry reference, yeah. <coughs> okay, so Magnum also uh, plays higher up on the stack, and they've, they've actually got a project there, a, a popular open source project called Magnum, uh, where they actually provide container clusters as a service. So right inside, uh, right inside their UI, you can bring up a, a Kubernetes cluster, a Swarm cluster, a Mesos cluster, um, and uh, interact with them via native APIs. So they, they don't try to uh, create some super API that somehow can translate across all of them for the most part. Um, <coughs> Although I think they kind of went a little bit in that direction with Kubernetes, it was the first one they did. But in general, the idea is just for you to stand up a, a, a container management cluster and go ahead and go uh, go at it and have all of the nice services, the auto healing, auto scaling, and so forth. <coughs> um, so it's also based uh, largely on infrastructure automation. That's the value proposition here. Uh, you know, obviously, infinite resources um, uh, provided as a service uses heat. Uh, does anybody know uh, OpenStack heat? Um, well, that's the, uh, that's the orchestration uh, mm -hmm. uh, language for uh, OpenStack. And it has a concept of a bay. A bay is basically one, one of these clusters lives. It's a cordoned off number of compute nodes. So it's, it's sort of a security boundary uh, around your cluster. Uh, provides healing, scaling, load balancers, a service integration. Um, so in addition to having the, for example, in the Kubernetes, in addition to having the load balancer that I mentioned on top of the service inside the container cluster, you can expose that service all the way up through a uh, load, their load balancer as a service, uh, service, uh, which also can be tied to a physical load balancer, which is kind of cool. And they also provide uh, security and TLS. So one thing they will do is actually do the uh, Kubernetes um, <coughs> auto configuration, all the cert generation and the client certs and all that on Kubernetes uh, for you, which is, like I mentioned, something Kubernetes supports but is lots of fun to set up. Okay, and of course it's OpenStack. <coughs> and I mentioned that uh, Kubernetes first and most mature as HA to the master, I didn't mention that. Um, so they add high ability to the manager. They provide multi-tenant isolation. They support VMs and bare metal uh, through their ironic project, um, aptly named because it's a cloud that serves up physical machines. It's funny. It's <laughs> ironic, you might say. And it's a very active project, a popular project. But it is <coughs> open stack, and the reason I saved that one for last is because it kind of leads into our story. Uh, Cloudify and Tosca. So, if you consider uh, Magnum style capabilities, so uh, multi multi container orchestrator uh, running in a cloud or on bare metal, uh, but without being uh, based on a proprietary orchestration model, <coughs> without being tied to a particular cloud, uh, allowing hybrid management, so uh, orchestration across multiple um, multiple clouds simultaneously as well as non-cloud workloads, I mean non-container workloads and uh, virtualized workloads. <coughs> and high availability and auto scaling for all the container orchestrators. Uh, just really quick, Tosca is an OASIS spec. It's basically just a meta, meta model for defining uh, deployments. So what it does is break down everything you would ever want to manage and some things that aren't even real. It really doesn't care. It's very generic. Um, you describe your entire um, orchestration in terms of components, which can be, for example, network components. We talk about OpenStack, for example, Neutron, uh, routers, load balancers, uh, networks, subnets, public keys, all that stuff, um, along with hosts and the applications that run on the hosts and the relationships between them all. The idea behind Tosca is to present that model something that's relatively static and have a an implied piece of software out there called an orchestrator that can interpret it and, and run the workflows on it. <coughs> so it's sample blueprint. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right now I was going to go with the sample blueprint. 
this one. This is an example swarm. I'm not going to go into great detail here. <coughs> if you're familiar with either the uh, uh, the Google or the Kubernetes YAML, the Compose YAML, Heat, whatever, it's similar. It's, you know, it's a YAML is a YAML. But the idea here is that we have things like hosts. We have hosts here. We have relationships. One of the relationships, we have a security group. Right, so we break everything down. We have a public IP. We have the manager, which actually represents the software that's going to stand up Docker itself, um, and the worker. So they can all turn. They can start Docker itself. They could actually download Docker itself if you wanted to wait that long. It doesn't kind of doesn't make sense. So, but uh, anyway, you can do whatever you need to do. Whatever work needs to be done on the node. And then these the relationships. For example, um, the manager. Is related is contained in as you'll see here to the manager and so forth. And the way this is all targeted at, at various uh, um, infrastructure as a service is by plugins. It's a very plugin-oriented system. So if you uh, in your blueprint you use OpenStack like this one does, uh, you'll see an OpenStack types. Um, you'll see here, for example, our manager host is derived is uh, of type. OpenStack node server, and basically what that does is tie all of the OpenStack APIs into that host for when it's time for it to be uh, created. So sorry I have to fly by that so fast. How do I start right from here? Okay. Let's start right from there. Okay. <coughs> yeah, okay, sounds good. All right, so the manager itself, the manager itself is the orchestrator. I'm not going to dig into this, but uh, you can kind of ignore this part over here because that's just the UI and the REST API, which is important, but not that critical for us to understand. Um, the idea is that the hosts are out here. They may or may not be running agents, depending on what you need, the need is. Um, there's a task broker, which is Celery out here. There's a metrics database for our nice UI, which displays metrics. That's InfluxDB. There's a policy engine. That's Raymond. And there's a workflow engine that runs everything through this. Okay. And everything that actually happens is happens by plugins. The orchestration engine has no knowledge of clouds or anything else. Um, and then just to dig a little bit more into the event processing, because that's important for the demo, just to understand what's going on. The Cloudify Manager is basically uh, built around a backbone of RabbitMQ. And uh, it's a a traditional uh, queue pattern here. We have a, an open source project called Diamond that collects metrics. It doesn't have to be Diamond, but that's the default. Pushes metrics into RabbitMQ. We have a, the real-time event processing system is Riemann. If the uh, metrics satisfy uh, the requirements there for a trigger to be fired on a given deployment, it will send that event into RabbitMQ as well. Then the deployment here uh, for example, if that trigger was scaled, the deployment itself knows what is in its blueprint, what what to be what needs to be scaled, and then the workflows actually get run by the management worker, goes out and runs the actual scale workflow, uh, which goes out and adds instances to the scale group, which could be um, more than just compute. It could also be storage. For example. <coughs> so a simple swarm demo. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's a, just a very microscopic. To max. Uh, yeah, I've got one here actually. Um, it's a very small uh, cluster. It's hardly classified. It's hardly qualifies as a cluster. So, one manager, one worker. And it's sufficient to show the infrastructure level of integration here. It will show us some auto healing, auto scale up, um, auto scale down. And uh, these two, just by virtue of how I have the thing configured, they happen really fast. So the scale up in particular happens really fast. So let's just see if we can get that going. Yeah. 
just the master of ceremonies. You're not just the master of ceremonies. Yeah, no, you're also the pub now. <laughs> okay. So one thing I can do here, uh, one concept of a blueprint that it has. <coughs> Outputs. One of the outputs here, for example, is the manager, like manager IP for Swarm here. I pre-started Swarm so we wouldn't have to sit around here waiting for it, uh, waiting for OpenStack. It takes, I figured it was going to be tight, time was going to be tight. Uh, this thing has to time out. So I have a uh, terminal session open on a uh, on node on that cloud. Not responding, but it will here. So I have confidence we saw this happen before. There we go. Hmm? No, I'll make it bigger. I don't know. Let's see. <coughs> all right. So I'm going to see all I know. I'm going to go to Manager uh, Road. It's just a simple command to get you up there. Now, I'd actually go on to the, uh, because I have the certificate I started this with on the manager now, but I have to do it this way. Um, it's still there. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So I'm just going out to the uh, swarm node. see them on the screen. If you wanted to look at, uh, this is the actual uh, OpenStack. Here you can see them there too. <coughs> so what I need to do in preparation, I actually preloaded some uh, container on there just to generate load. See the CPU utilization spiking here. There's a sliding window on the scale workflow there you see at the start. So there's a sliding window of about 10 seconds. So it takes a second for it to kick in. Um, so right now uh, we can go look at logs and events. You can see things. You can see sort of the sausage being made over here. Um, <coughs> uh, basically what's happening now is that workflow is being executed which results in a bunch of celery tasks which a lot of them do their thing in this case relatively small number of things. I'm just going to show it in. Um, actually, execution started. Let's see if we see a new, a new node instance here. We might have already passed it. I hope I didn't miss it. Okay, now we see two workers. <coughs> Almost immediately, um, after a very abbreviated cooldown period, it'll since nothing else is going on on the box, it'll return back to one. Um, you don't have to sit and walk away for that to happen. I'll just. Well, yes we do. I don't think it takes that long. It shocked me before. I was afraid I was going to be talking by the time I got to this screen. It would already be gone. But, um, Back to this in a sec, but I just wanted to go through the next uh, 
<coughs> we're going to have like one more slide. So. All right. So uh, also, uh, let's consider the, uh, the hybrid possibilities as well. So beyond infrastructure management, right? We've got cloud cloud neutral deployment with cloud neutral auto scaling at the infrastructure level. Um, I can also show healing, although I think uh, everybody will be in a coma by the time <laughs> we get to that. Uh, uh, so uh, consider an architecture with mixed container, non-container components. You know, uh, with, I talked about Kubernetes being kind of biased towards a, uh, a workload that's more web oriented because of the, the sort of the load balancing uh, features and so forth, and they're just their business <coughs> in general. Uh, but uh, if you have a, say, a, uh, for example, even Google, I don't think would claim that uh, an Oracle database was a great target for a microservice. You know? um, so, you know, imagine you have a database on the outside, not containerized, mm -hmm. maybe virtualized, maybe not. And then you have a, a containerized uh, web tier. Uh, so, uh, this is a good. A good use for an unopinionated orchestrator who doesn't really know the difference between either one of those things and is basically programmable to any of it. <coughs> All components can be modeled in blueprints, uh, one or more, um, and the configuration can be overlaid on a native YAML descriptor. So there's actually an example out on our website of this uh, where um, where we take a, a Mongo database uh, that's just running in a conventional VM and then a Kubernetes cluster running a Node.js uh, front end on top of it and the orchestrator make, uh, having the ability to basically start up the containers in a way that they can properly connect to the database, which is external uh, in, a, in a, concise, uh, a concise format. So uh, let's go back to here though, just for case. Okay. All right. So I see we only have one worker left. So if you want to see healing, you can come see me afterwards, and I'll heal for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I want to skip the walkthrough then. Of that uh, it's just one. Yeah, that's wrong. Okay. Uh, this is just an example here. It's actually, uh, this is the node seller configuration. It's actually taking an input of a pod file. This is a, a Kubernetes native descriptor and then overloading uh, information from elsewhere in the blueprint. So the blueprint will have access, for example, to the MongoDB IP and this way it can insert it into the, into the actual descriptor without actually overwriting it. So it creates an, another copy with the overrided values and it submits that to Kubernetes and then everything comes up and connected. I'll show you in detail if you want to see that afterwards. <coughs> Yes. All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, that's all I got. <laughs>